Now, the topic for this evening's sermon is I'm going to be teaching on the blood of Christ. And the title of my sermon is Without Shedding of Blood is No Remission. Now, it might seem like a very simple topic, and it actually is as far as the doctrine is concerned. However, this doctrine is under attack. It's been under attack. There's like every fundamental doctrine of the Bible. There are people that will go out and deceive and try to teach something different. And this is something that if we don't take the time and go through it and look and see what the scripture says, you might be swayed by someone else who comes along and starts questioning it if you don't have a good reason or a good answer or um, it's never really been established in your mind how important the shedding of Jesus Christ's actual blood is. Not just um, a metonym or metaphor uh, for, for something else or just his death. The shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ is very important. We're going to see from Old Testament examples as well as New Testament how important that the shedding of blood is. It's a requirement in order for our sins to be purged, to be washed away, to be clean. It has to come through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, that does not mean that the other aspects of Jesus Christ's perfect life or of his death on the cross or of his descension into hell, or of his resurrection from the dead are not important or not necessary. No, it's all necessary. It's all required. However, you cannot eliminate the shed blood of Jesus Christ that he shed for us physically and the sprinkling of that blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Now, we're going to get to all that. We're going to prove this for a minute. But before we get into that, I'm going to give you a warning about a, a Bible teacher out there. His name is John MacArthur. And John MacArthur is, is very popular on the internet and just in different circles. And he claims that the blood of Jesus Christ, when the Bible talks about the blood being necessary for atoning for your sins and paying for sins, is just a metonym for Jesus' death. It's not exactly the same as a synonym, synonym but um, if you don't know what a metonym is, it's basically just replacing one. It's, it's very similar to, to a synonym. Um, I'm not going to get into to the details on that. But um, the point is it's, it's basically using like an illustration or example to, to convey the same truth. But the reason why this John MacArthur is dangerous, not just because of this one doctrine. See, this one doctrine just exposes that he's a false prophet. He's, he's a lying devil. But... The, I mean, the big problems with him is his lordship salvation. He believes in this, like, repent of your sins, making Jesus the Lord of your life. And basically what that does is that added, adds works into your own salvation. So the lordship salvation means, oh, no, no, you need to, you know, Jesus has to become your lord or your boss and just you're going to be doing or willing to do everything that Jesus tells you to do. That's works. Now, should we treat Jesus as our Lord? Of course we should. He is the Lord. But this, this attitude of like um, just obeying every single thing is, is, not a, is not a requirement for salvation. Accepting a free gift through the blood of Jesus Christ, through what Jesus did for us, through his love for us, and receiving eternal life, through faith, by just putting your faith in Jesus Christ, that's how a person gets saved. You don't have to, to quit drinking or quit smoking or quit any other sin, for that matter, in order to be able to get saved. It's not the way it works, but that's the way that the Lordship Salvation crowd will teach it. So he believes in that nonsense. He's also a Calvinist. <coughs> and I'm bringing all this up because... You know, you may like some of his stands on other topics or whatever. I don't care. I don't even know what all of his stands are. It doesn't matter because these are deal breakers. You shouldn't be listening to somebody who, oh, well, he's good on this. He's good on that. Oh, yeah, except for that whole salvation thing. He's got that wrong. Or except for that whole thing where he says that, yeah, it's not the actual blood of Jesus Christ that washes away our sins. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah, that, that one minor detail. That one minor, we'll, we'll see how minor that detail is when we go through the scripture tonight. Now, Hebrews 9, where we started, has, I mean, this, this is probably the best chapter that really defines and lays out how important the blood is. But there are so many other verses. But before we get into that, I have quotes from John MacArthur's website authored by him out of his own mouth. This isn't just something that, you know, I heard someone else and I'm just repeating it because. 
to be quite honest with you, that's what a lot of people are claiming now after this whole controversy. Now, look, this controversy is, is like decades old that this guy came out with, but he's still around and he's still teaching. He's been teaching in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and into the 2000s. He's been teaching for a long time and he's got a big following. But the guy is a heretic. And I want to point out explicit examples for you just in case you have a, a soft spot for John MacArthur or you, you read his study Bible or you, you, know, you, take, you get other teachings from him is from his, his website. I think his website is called Grace to You. So be aware of this. And I'm going to read this for you. Now, I pulled out excerpts and I forget what the title was, but it's something of, it has to do specifically with the blood of Jesus Christ was, was what his article is about. And the guy is really sneaky. After reading this article that he posted, listen up. After reading this article, this is how the deceivers and the false prophets work. They're very, the best ones are very cunning because he starts off by quoting. What he does is he takes quotes from all these different sermons and stuff that he's preached because he was getting a backlash for what he said about the blood of Jesus Christ, and rightfully so. A lot of people were, were calling him a heretic, and rightfully so. So he has this whole article up there, and he's, and he's saying, well, I said this and this sermon, this and this sermon. And he starts off listing things that sound just fine. It sounds like, yeah, he's talking about the blood of Jesus Christ, and he's quoting verses, and he's saying all this stuff. But that's how they deceive you. They, they, he gains your confidence or tries to, to build up your trust in what he's saying by saying things that all sound good, that all sound like they match up with Scripture, before then he gets into his perversion and his twisting of Scripture and changing the meaning by just saying, oh, this is actually a metonym. And you know, honestly, this is what the, the you know, people who don't believe the Bible love to do with Scripture anyways. They love to say, Whatever it is in the Bible that they want to change, they'll just say, oh, well, it really means, I know it says this, but that's not really what it means. Let me give you the real meaning of it. And sometimes people will, will say they have to go back to the Greek or the Hebrew, and they want to tell you the real meaning of the Bible, or they're going to tell you you have to understand the culture in order to understand the true meaning of the Bible. You don't understand the way things were back then. If you knew that, then you would understand how it doesn't really mean what it says. Don't buy into that baloney of people saying the Bible doesn't mean what it says because you know what? It means exactly what it says. The Bible is for the common man. It's for everybody. You don't have to be some theologian or some scholar to understand the words of the Bible. All you have to be is saved. All you have to have is the Holy Ghost residing within you and you could understand God's word. So here's some of the quotes that I pulled. This is all from the same article, but what these quotes are, are referencing different sermons that he's preached or whatever. So here's, here's a quote by John MacArthur. It says, and this, was, and this was God by sign and symbol, always showing the wages of sin is what? Death constantly. So he's trying to lay the groundwork of the wages of sin being death, right? The punishment for sin, which, yeah, Romans 6, 23 says that. We get it, right? We know that. And he says, and there's no sense in getting teary-eyed and mystical about blood, and we sing hymns, there's power in the blood, etc., and we don't want to get preoccupied with blood. The only importance the blood of Jesus has is that it showed he died. There is no saving in that blood itself. So he's saying, we don't need to get all pre -eyed. We don't have to worry about the blood. Basically, all the blood is showing is just that he died. He said, because the wages of sin is death, so Jesus had to die, and that's it. And the blood just is just another way of saying that he died. This is ultimately the stand that he takes on this topic, and it's clear when you read through it. I'm not misrepresenting him. You could go look it up for yourself. And I'm actually just reading these quotes for you verbatim. Okay? And he continues on. He says, we cannot say that the very blood of Jesus, his physical blood, is what atones for sin. It is his death that atones for sin. His bloodshed was an act of death. And so we do not want to become preoccupied with fantasizing about some mystical blood that's floating around somewhere. It is by his sacrificial offering of himself. It is by his death that we are redeemed. Bloodshed is only the picture of his death. Now, I'm not going to comment on that anymore because we're going to see what the Scripture... Let's just read the Bible later on. We're going to get to that. Let's just read the Scripture and just determine, are we going to believe John MacArthur and his just twisting or, or 
just saying, well, this is actually what it means? Or are we just going to believe what the scripture actually says? Because he's saying that it's not the shed blood of Jesus Christ at all, that it's only his death, that that's all that. It's like as if you were to say, well, his resurrection doesn't really matter. It's just the death. He just had to die because, hey, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin isn't resurrection. So, hey, the wages of sin is death, so it must just be the death. He takes that type of, of oversimplification of the atonement for our sins and just say, well, that's it. The blood doesn't matter at all. And it's completely false. Here's another quote. It's going to keep getting weirder and weirder and worse and worse as we go. I mean, that's bad enough. Just saying, nope, the physical blood means nothing. Doesn't matter. Keep in mind, there's another quote, that when I talk about Christ sprinkling his blood on the mercy seat, I'm not saying he literally sprinkled his physical blood on some physical object in the heavenlies. I believe the writer is speaking in a symbolic sense. Again, just go, well, this is all just symbolism. Well, it's all just symbolic. It is an illustration which pictures the atoning effect of Christ's death on the cross. Now, we're going to see this a little later, but keep this in mind, too. He says, oh, he didn't actually sprinkle any blood on any actual mercy seat in heaven. If there's no mercy seat in heaven, if there's no sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat in heaven, then why in the world, when you read through the book of Exodus and you see all the requirements for the tabernacle that God gave unto Moses, why did it all have to be erected and built perfectly as the manner is in heaven. The Bible says that there's a tabernacle in heaven. The Bible says that these things exist in heaven, that the image that was made here on earth is a picture of what exists in heaven, that it's actually there, that this isn't just symbolism, that there's actually a mercy seat in heaven. Keep that in mind, because I'm, I'm going to prove that later on. I just want to get through all these quotes before we just dig in and just deal with the Bible the rest of the time. I'm just going to prove to you John MacArthur is a heretic. And you ought to be aware of him, and you shouldn't be getting doctrine from him. And people get mixed up in his Calvinism because they think he's some great preacher or whatever when he's really just a heretic and he believes in his lordship salvation. Don't get mixed up into this guy. The Bible says, now notice, or not the Bible, oh man, God forbid, this is not the Bible. This is another quote from John MacArthur. Excuse me for that. Now notice, I talked about the death and the blood of Christ as being synonymous. That brings us to the heart of this issue. The blood that was shed is so closely associated with the sacrifice of his life on the cross that blood is often used in scripture to refer to his death. Thus, it is true that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, as Hebrews 9.22 says. So he's saying the only reason why the Bible is true when it says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, what he's saying is that because... His blood just means his death. That's, that's what he's saying there. Since his blood just means his death, that's the only reason why Hebrews 9.22 is right when it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But shedding of blood means much more than simply bleeding. Bleeding and dying are two different things. So bleeding and dying are two different things, but he just said bleeding is synonymous with dying. Well, which one is it? Are they two different things or is it the same thing, John MacArthur? And this is how a false prophet speaks out of both sides of their mouth. They get people confused and they just say these things and they continue with their statements. And a lot of people end up going, wait a minute, how did we get to this point? And then they just keep moving on and don't think about it long enough and don't challenge it. He keeps he keep continuing on with this quote. He says, but bleeding and dying are not two separate elements of Christ's sacrifice, both of which accomplish salvation. So he says, bleeding and dying are two different things. Previously, he said that bleeding and dying mean the same thing. Then he says they're two different things. And then he says they're not two separate elements of Christ's sacrifice, that it's the same element, that bleeding and dying are the same thing. So he goes from them being the same thing to being two different things to being the same thing again, whenever it's convenient for him. It says, he says his sacrifice for sin was one act that involved both his dying and his pouring out of his blood. Sacrificial death was the essential element and references to blood are symbolic references to the death he died. And that's it. And that's where he just says, that's all the blood really means. It's just a symbol. The whole time, it's all just one big symbol. Here's another quote. 
Now watch the term, the blood of Christ is a metonym that is substitute for another term, death. So he's saying it's just a metonym. When you, when you see the blood of Christ, it just means death. It is the blood of Christ that simply is a metonym for the death of Christ. But it is used, he said, here's why it's used. Because the Hebrews used such a metonym to speak of violent death. He said, and that's why they use it, just so you could understand it's a violent death. Whenever you talk about the blood of somebody being poured out to the Hebrew, that meant violent death. And notice, he's, he's going back to, well, you've got to understand the way that the Hebrews were. You've got to understand their culture. This is what they did. And this is how you're going to understand the Bible. And there's no way you would ever know this if it weren't for me because I know the Hebrew culture and I could explain that this is a metonym to you. Watch out for those types of people. Continuing on here, he says, and when you commune with the blood of Christ, it doesn't mean the literal blood of Christ. That is a metonym for his death. You commune with his death. Another quote, now let me say something that might shake some of you up, but I'll try to qualify it. And again, this is just more of his heresy. This is all direct quotes from his own website, from his own mouth. There is nothing in the actual blood that is efficacious for sin. That word efficacious means that it is the, it is the thing that is atoning for your sin, that that relieves your sin, that, that pays for your sin. He says there's nothing efficacious, not effective towards your sin. He says there is nothing in the actual blood that is efficacious for sin. Did you get that? The Bible does not teach that blood of Christ itself has any efficacy for taking away sin, not at all. Well, I'm sorry to, con to confuse you with the Bible, John MacArthur, but that's actually exactly what the Bible says, that it is his blood. He said, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. How could that not be efficacy? There is no remission of sins without the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. You false prophet, you heretic, the actual blood of Christ isn't the issue. He continues on. The issue is that his poured out blood was symbolic of his violent death. The death was the thing that paid the price, right? The wage of sin is what? Death. He died for us. It is his death that is the issue. He just keeps on trying to bring it back and just focus only on the death. Now look, we already have said before, of course his death had to happen. Of course that's an important aspect of the whole um, process that Jesus had to go through in order to pay for our sins in full. But what he's trying to do is eliminate the blood from that process. He's just saying, well, it's just the death. It's all just the death. And again, he, he, he quotes a reference here about the Hebrews. Well, we've got to understand the Hebrews. The Hebrews spoke of it as his outpoured blood because that was something that expressed violent death. And they believed, for example, in the Old Testament, it said, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so the pouring out of blood was the significance of death. And so when it says here we are communing with the blood of Christ, it does not mean the literal blood of Christ is efficacious. It does not mean the literal blood of Christ is involved. It means we enter into a genuine vital participation in his death, but it is not the blood. The blood is only the symbol of the poured out life. Now, this is where it gets really bizarre. And as I was reading this, now, I, I've already heard this. I've seen some of these quotes before. I knew this. I knew John MacArthur was a wolf. This is nothing new for me, but I'd never gone through and read this whole article, which I did in preparation for the sermon. And I was just like, <laughs> This is, it just gets really weird. Here's another quote from this article. He says, and the reason, and I just want to make it clear, the reason it speaks so often in the New Testament of Christ's blood being shed is not telling us that Jesus bled to death. He did not bleed to death. So he's saying he didn't die from a, from a loss of blood. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us the exact thing that happened within his body that caused him to die. Was he bleeding on the cross? You better believe he was ble bleeding on the cross. He said he was able to tell all his bones. Now the physical cause could be asphyxiation, the way that he was hanging up on the cross. That's one way. It could have been organ shutting. I mean, who knows, right? Who knows the exact reason, your know, exact physical cause of death? It's not that important. The Bible doesn't even say it, and the Bible doesn't say he actually just bled to death, but it did say he bled, and he shed his blood to atone for our sins. But he's now kind of building up this straw man, but what gets really weird about this is, is what he says, 
how Jesus died. Listen to this. Because he's basically going to say that Jesus commits suicide. Yes, you heard me right. He's basically saying that Jesus commit suicide up on the cross. Now, if Jesus says that he's going to offer up himself as a sacrifice and he's allowing certain things to happen, it's still not him committing suicide or taking his own life, right? He's allowing it to happen, but the wicked people that are doing it to him are responsible for what they're doing to him. But here's what he says, and he references the verse that says, it says here, um, he references the verse that says, no man takes my life from me. He says, I lay it down by myself. Now, of course, he's quoting some other phony version of the Bible, but you know what, what he's referring to there is that Jesus said, hey, no one's going to take my life. I'm going to lay down my life. But in this, in this, we know what Jesus meant when he said that is that he has the power, if he wanted to, to not be put to death. He would have the power to set up his kingdom if he wanted to on earth at that moment, if, if that's what he wanted to do, but that wasn't the will of the Father, and that wasn't his will. He had the power to do these things. He had the power to allow the things to happen. He, had to, the, you know, he allowed himself to go through that stuff. But here's what he said, how he said he died. He says, do you know how he died? He willed himself to dead. Don't ever forget that. He willed, that means he made himself die. He just, he just willed it, just saying, well, as he was up on that cross, he just willed himself and just said, I'm dying now. Like, I'm just, I am going to choose to die right now. That is suicide. Willing yourself, how is willing yourself to death if you're Jesus Christ on the cross different from taking a gun and saying, well, I want to die. I'm going to will myself to death and shooting yourself in the head. Just because Jesus was able to do it through supernatural means doesn't, means doesn't make it not a suicide. Jesus didn't murder himself, but that's what this heretic John MacArthur is saying. I'm going to continue on with this quote. He says, and listen to me. When the soldier came over and pierced the side of Jesus, what came out? Blood and water. The blood was still in his body long after he was dead. He did not bleed to death. Now, what kind of idiot is going to think that in order to bleed to death, that all of your blood in your body has to be gone before you can actually bleed to death. I mean, wh what type of stupid comment is that? Does he not know that people actually bleed to death? You could, you could die from a loss of blood and still have blood in your body. You could still have quite a bit of blood in your body, but not enough for your body to be sustained. So just because the soldiers pierced him, and blood came out doesn't mean that he didn't die of a loss of blood. That doesn't mean that at all. Just, there is still some more blood in his body. And anyone who actually bleeds to death, there's still blood left in their body. You, know, you don't have to be a medical doctor to understand that point. It's pretty basic. It's pretty simple. He says, continuing on here, he says, And the point that I think the Bible is making here, making there, is Jesus was never bled to death as a victim. He died because he willed himself dead. And then he quotes another. He says, Father, what? Into thy hands I commend my spirit. He died as a fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifice, and that's why it talks about his blood. Now, when Jesus said, into my hands I commit my spirit, does that mean he willed himself to death? Look, people say things dying in their last breath on their deathbed it doesn't mean that they make themselves die. If you know you're about to die, and many people do, this isn't unique to Jesus Christ, many people are in a hospital, and they know they're on their deathbed, and they actually know that the time is really, really close. Now, do I completely understand how that happens? No, but something within them lets them know in many cases that they're, able, they're about to die. So they'll say their last parting words. And maybe they say something to Jesus. And you know what? Stephen, right, the martyr Stephen, also spake to God and spake to Jesus Christ right before his death too. Does that mean he willed himself dead when they were stoning him? No, of course not. And Jesus didn't will himself dead. Continuing on here with his quote, I'm almost done. This is almost the end of his quote. We're just going to dig into scripture for the rest of the time. He says, and please, I'm not, I'm not on the first leg of liberalism. I'm not denying the precious blood of Christ. Oh, yeah, you are. Actually, you are. You're denying the precious blood of Christ. 
because you're saying it doesn't mean blood. You're saying it just means death. And you're just trying to make the Bible say whatever has come into your heart and whatever has come into your mind because it didn't come by the Holy Ghost. He says, and I mean, I mean that seriously. I know that whenever you talk about something, you're talking about something that's very sentimental to us. I just want you to understand what it means. His blood saves us only in the sense that his death was the sacrificial death of the final lamb. And you want to know something? He never lost his blood, the majority of it. Now, how would he even know how much blood he lost? How can you make that statement? Well, he didn't lose the majority of his blood. How do you know that, John MacArthur? Were you there? Oh, just because when the soldiers pierced him, he still had some blood in his body, that means he didn't lose the majority of his blood? How would you know that, you liar? Apparently, only some of it came out of those wounds, and those would have sealed up pretty fast with nails there. As if the only place that Jesus would, be, would have been bleeding was his hands. Oh, yeah, that would have sealed up, because you're the expert, John MacArthur, on nailing people to a cross, right? Oh, but apparently you didn't read the part where they scourged Jesus Christ, they whipped him, they beat him, they beat him with the rod, they put a crown of thorns on his head. You know, last I checked, the head bleeds pretty severely, pretty profusely when you get a small cut on your head. How many cuts do you think Jesus had on his head when they planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and then buffeted him with a rod? You lying devil. Yeah, you're going to lose a lot of blood. Jesus Christ said that, it, that his, his countenance was marred more than any man. That's what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah. He was beat up really bad. He was bleeding before he even went to the cross. On his way to the cross, he was bleeding. In order for him to say, I can tell or count my bones. Yeah, he was bleeding really bad, John MacArthur. He says the majority of his blood remained in his body at least a half an hour and maybe longer after his death. And it was his death that was the issue. So he just wants to focus on the death of Christ and just completely ignore the blood and just say, well, anytime blood is used, it just means a death. Every single time. Well, if you're still in Hebrews 9, flip over to Hebrews 10 real quick because I want you to see this verse because this applies perfectly to John MacArthur. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, the Bible says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He's counting the blood of Christ like it's not a big deal, like it's not a holy thing. Like it's not something that separated the pure blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, it's just his death. Oh, yeah, that, the blood, that's not a holy thing. Snake John MacArthur. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to go through this now. That, that's enough of the quotes from the heretic. I just wanted to give you enough to show you how bad it really is so that you don't get sucked into any of his teachings because the guy's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And if you've got a John MacArthur study Bible, throw it in the trash. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number 9. Let's go back to Hebrews 9. We're going to start reading again in verse number 11. The Bible says, But Christ, became, being come and high priest, of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, I want you to notice as we're rereading -reading this chapter in Hebrews 9, how many times Jesus' blood is referenced. And you decide for yourself if you think the only thing that blood has to do with is just the fact that he died. We'll see. We'll, we'll just let the Bible speak for itself. Verse number 13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, 
Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now you're going to see there, it talked about the blood and then it talked about his death, but that doesn't mean that they're synonymous. And I'll also even give this, that sometimes when the blood is being referred to, you very well could use it as, as, as talking about death, it, depending on the context. That, that, may be, that may be a possibility at some points throughout the Scripture. But we're going to see very clearly tonight that that is not the case. You can't just say, well, I found in one place where the blood appears to be used synonymously with death, so every time that word is used, we can just always substitute it. Because the context dictates whether or not that's even possible. Whether or not you could even do that. Verse number 16, the Bible says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, is the death of Jesus Christ important? Yes, it is. The point of the sermon is not to take away from the death of Jesus Christ. Of course it's important. Of course he had to die, but he also had to bleed. The blood is very important. He couldn't have just died without bleeding, as it seems like John MacArthur might say, because he just says, well, just one and the same thing. It's just talking about his death. It's just a violent death. It just had to be a violent death. You can die violently without bleeding, but the fact that Jesus Christ had to bleed is very important. Just like all of the references to the blood of the animal sacrifices. They could have killed animals and sacrificed their dead corpses, their dead bodies, in many other ways other than shedding their blood. You didn't have to just shed their blood. But no, their blood was shed. Their blood was sprinkled. Their blood was used in the atonement, in their sacrifices, in all the rituals. They were used, and they were used specifically because they showed what Jesus was going to do and the fact that Jesus' blood must be shed. Continuing on here. Verse 18, Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept... Now look, it's very specifically talking about blood. It wasn't dedicated without blood. Not without death, but specifically without blood because blood was used at the dedication of the First Testament and blood was also used at the dedication of the Second Testament. Verse 19, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Now let's just think about that for a minute. This is what was happening in the Old Testament. This is when Moses was dedicating things. He literally took blood, the blood of bulls and calves and goats, and he, and he took this blood and he started sprinkling it. He sprinkled it on the book, the Bible says, and on all the people. He was literally sprinkling blood onto the people. People today might think, oh man, that's kind of gross. Like, I don't, I don't know if I'd want to have blood just sprinkled on me. But there's a reason for it. Yes, the blood was symbolic back then because it was symbolism, symbolizing the blood of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ's blood is what cleanses us and washes us from our sins, as the Bible says very clearly. Verse number 20, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So basically, everything that had to do with the service of God, the tabernacle, the, 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 the tools, the instruments that are used, he's sprinkling everything with blood. Why? Because he's purifying it all, because he's cleansing it all, and he's using the blood to do it, because there is an emphasis on the blood, not just on the death. Because the blood is important. Verse number 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. The blood had to be shed. You cannot have remission of sins without the blood. 
How much more clear? Can we just believe the Bible for what it says instead of trying to come up with our own reasoning and our own things and just come up with weird, bizarre doctrines out of our own heart and just say, nope, blood doesn't matter, even though the Bible very clearly says it does. It's just the death. Verse number 23, it was therefore necessary. It was necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What is that saying? Let's read that again. He just described how the blood was being sprinkled on everything in the tabernacle and on the people and on the book in the days of Moses, right? You got a tabernacle. Everyone pay attention. Listen up. You have a tabernacle that Moses built according to the way God told him to build it. At the dedication, at the beginning of them using that to make sacrifices and stuff, he sprinkled blood on everything. And the Bible says that that was necessary, that the patterns, what is a pattern? It's something that's modeled after something else. So the things on this earth were patterned after things that are in heaven. Again, which is why God was very specific in how those things were to be designed and built. They aren't the actual things in heaven, but they are patterned after the things in heaven. Kind of like man was made in the image of God. Are we God? No. But God made man in his likeness or in his image. Well, the tabernacle that existed was made in the image of heavenly things, of the things that are in the heavens. Now, all of the things on this earth were sprinkled with blood. Because again, it's a pattern of what happens or happened in heaven. That's why I said, we'll read this again, verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, the patterns are the things here, the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things, or the things that are actually in heaven themselves, with better sacrifices than these. So the things that are in heaven don't receive the blood of bulls and of goats, because the blood of the bulls and goats aren't what take away the sin. That's not where our salvation comes from. It doesn't come through blood of bulls and goats. They could never take away sin. The Bible says, because, because the blood that, that was uh, sprinkled in heaven was the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse number 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. What are the true? The true things in heaven. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus Christ goes into heaven, into the holy tabernacle, into the presence of God to be the sacrifice for our sins and to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat and on the tabernacle in order to atone for our sins. The way that it was done here on earth was a picture, was a representation of what had to happen in heaven to provide the ultimate sacrifice for us. Verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Basically saying that Jesus Christ only had to die one time. Every year the priest had to go in and offer that sacrifice. Every single year is a continual thing. Why? Again, because the blood of bulls and of goats does not take away sin. And what they were doing was representing what was going to happen in the future with Jesus Christ. But once Jesus Christ performed that, he only had to die once, one time for all, which is why once he did that, there is no more purpose for doing the animal sacrifices here on earth because Jesus Christ's blood is now applied in heaven on the mercy seat and, and everything is, uh, has happened um, accordingly. Now, in the Old Testament, we're going to see, turn if you would to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. In the Old Testament, we see the clear teaching of the blood requirement. This should not be some strange thing 
that blood is required because it's all throughout the Old Testament. I've, I've got a couple examples for you. The transition from Old Testament sacrifices to Jesus being the sacrifice in the New Testament is very clearly explained in Hebrews. And you could read the whole book of Hebrews, okay? But specifically around chapters 9, 10, 11, you're going to find a lot in Hebrews that we'll talk about. There are 8, 9, and 10 that talk about Jesus Christ. And, you know, you read about him being Melchizedek. And going even back further, chapter 4, 5, you know, you go through those chapters and see how Jesus Christ is the high priest. There's a new order at the order of Melchizedek. And, um, and explaining all of that, all the transition to the New Testament. And the blood having to be shed goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, and they, got, they, they, they received knowledge of good and evil from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they knew that they were naked, they knew that they had to be covered, and they had to cover their shame. So the way that they tried to do is they sewed fig leaves together and tried to cover up their nakedness. Well, that wasn't good enough. Their own efforts weren't good enough. They weren't able to cover their own shame. So God had to step in, and God provided for them coats of skins that were completely able to cover them. Now, where do you think the coats of skins came from? Well, they're skins. He didn't just skin an animal and leave it alive. The animal had to die. There was a sacrifice performed and there was shedding of blood within that sacrifice in order to provide them coats of skins. That goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Then you have the, the blood of the Passover lamb. The blood of all of the sacrifices that were, that were given to, to Moses. And you could read all about those throughout the Old Testament. And then you have, uh, with the Passover lamb, actually at the event of Passover, not just the, the continual yearly thing, but what that, that sacrifice represented, the, the first Passover, the real, you know, I call it the real Passover, what the, the remembrance was for after that, is found in Exodus chapter 12. That's where I had you turn. And we see there that the, the, the angel of death, you know, when God caused the firstborn to die, passed over the house that had the blood of the slain lamb applied to the door. Look at verse number 12 in Exodus chapter 12. The Bible says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, what I want you to notice here is that the angel did not pass over the house that just killed a lamb, right? Because what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to slay a lamb. And they were supposed to eat the lamb in that night, but they also had to take the blood of the lamb and apply it to the doorpost of the house that they were staying in. And the way that they would not lose their firstborn is if they saw the blood. When the angel sees it, he says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. He didn't say, when I see the death of the lamb, when I see the corpse of the lamb, when I just see a lamb's dead body, I'll pass over you. That's not what he said. Because you know what? The lamb's dead body, the death of Jesus Christ, the, the death of Jesus' body does no good to anyone unless his blood is applied to you. That's why the blood is so important. The blood had to be on their doorpost in order for the death they know to pass over them. And if you want to get to heaven and to escape the condemnation of hell, the blood of Jesus Christ needs to be applied to you. It is of no effect unless you have faith. The death means nothing without faith, and the faith is what applies that blood to you. So yeah, I think the blood's pretty important. Ask the people that were in Egypt at the time if the blood was important. I wonder if there is any of them that actually killed a lamb but didn't feel like going out and applying the blood on their doorposts. I wonder what happened to them. You know what? I don't have to wonder what happened to them because I know what the Bible says. I know what God's word says. The Bible says that the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So guess what? If you didn't see the blood, we know what happened. 
Because God's not sloppy. He doesn't just, well, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to look for the blood, but I'm not really looking for the blood. I'm really just looking for a, a, a violent death, which is another stupid thing. Because does it have to really be a violent death in order to sacrifice a lamb? Does it have to be real violent? I mean, you're not taking the lamb and beating it up and doing, you don't have to do all this stuff. What they had to do was just sacrifice a lamb and shed his blood and cook it up. Roast with fire, by the way. Roast with fire, not sodden with water, not, not prepared any other way. Roast with fire, symbolizing that Jesus Christ's soul did go to hell. Yes, the fiery hell. That's a sermon for another day. But let's move on to, well, uh, here, as long as we're in Exodus, turn, if you would, to Leviticus 17. We see one more Old Testament example. There's lots in the Old Testament, but I just didn't want to go to all of them for sake of time. There's so many of them that, talk about, that deal with the blood. Leviticus 17, I just wanted to point out this other one. Then we'll get into New Testament scriptures and be done with this, but there's, there's so much to this. Leviticus 17, verse 11, the Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. But like John MacArthur says, well, the blood just uh, just a metonym for death, right? So the life of the flesh is in the death. Oh, wait, that doesn't make any sense. So I guess when it's convenient for him, he just wants to talk about the blood meaning death, and when it's not convenient for him, then it just means actual blood. Instead of just taking the Bible for what it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. He says, just as the blood is the life of the flesh, our blood in our bodies provide life to our flesh. The blood goes through our entire body as we have veins and provides life to our flesh. That's why we're still alive, because we have this blood. The blood, likewise, provides life or an atonement for our soul. But it's not our own blood that does it. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. How, how complicated is this, really? The only people that make it complicated are the ones that don't believe God's word, like John MacArthur. He's like the Pharisees. They could quote scripture all day long. But they don't believe it. The Pharisees claim Moses. They claim to believe Moses. They claim to believe the Bible. But Jesus Christ said, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me. He could claim Christ all he wants. It doesn't make him saved. It doesn't mean he actually believes because he's not believing in the blood. And guess what? That blood is not applied to him because he doesn't believe in it. Let's go to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 26. New Testament. Clear scriptures on blood. I'm going to try to blow through some of these a little bit quicker. But you're going to get the, and some of these might be a little bit redundant, so I'll try to, to pay attention to that as we go through these. But, I mean, just think about this when you take communion, because we're going to look at this in Matthew 26. What do you do at, at the, when, we, when we take communion or the Lord's Supper? We eat unleavened bread, right? And we drink the pure wine, which in today's language we would call that grape juice or juice, okay, the, the pure blood of the vine. Because just as the, the, the bread is symbolic of the body of Jesus Christ, it is unleavened, because leaven is used in the Bible to symbolize sin, and Jesus was without sin, so we don't put any leaven in the bread that we eat. Similarly, we don't have leaven, leaven or fermentation of yeast in the representation of Jesus' blood because Jesus was without sin. That's why we drink the pure blood of the vine, to represent the pure blood of Jesus Christ. And in that remembrance of Jesus Christ, what are we doing? It's body and blood. His body was put to death. His body died, his blood was shed. Two distinct aspects of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Body, blood. 
They're not one and the same thing, John MacArthur. I know you said they're different, then you said they're the same, and then you said they're different. But they're not the same. Matthew 26, 27, the Bible says, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, he said, This is my blood. My blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. My blood for the remission of sins. Is there any confusion? Les, can you take her out, please, and, and deal with her appropriately? Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to see another phrase used in the Bible. It talks about the blood of sprinkling. Now, just the fact that, that the Bible puts in there, it adds sprinkling. It cannot be synonymous with just death because you're not sprinkling death. You're, you sprinkle blood. This is talking about literal, actual blood. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 23, the Bible says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. That's kind of funny. Grace unto you right after he says the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ's blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat that exists in heaven. Yes, it was. And it was necessary to do so. Grace to you. 1 Peter chapter 1, jump down to verse number 18. The Bible says, for as much as we know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. You're not redeemed. You weren't purchased. You weren't saved with corruptible things as silver and gold, like idols, silver, gold, idols, molten images. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But here is how we were redeemed but with the precious blood of Christ. Did you hear that? What redeems us? The precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. It's not the precious death of Jesus. It's the precious blood of Jesus that redeems us. 1 John 1, verse number 7. The Bible says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Revelation 1, verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. He used his blood to wash our sins away. I mean, how much more clear can you get? We read verse after verse after verse in the New Testament. That's why all those songs exist, John MacArthur. That's why there's so many hymns. It's not just some sentimental attachment to these songs that give us the doctrine of being washed by the blood of Jesus Christ from our sins, that we need the blood of Jesus applied to us, that Jesus need to pay for our sins by shedding his blood and sprinkling his blood on the mercy seat. 
That's not from a song. It's from the Holy Bible. Try reading it. Ephesians 2, verse 12, the Bible says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. It's all throughout Scripture. This is such a fundamental doctrine. Let's not lose this one. Let's, we got to hold on and fight for this faith. We need to understand the blessing that God has given us and the, and the gift, but also how it works. Why is it so important? Why, why were things so bloody in the Old Testament? I mean, think about that. Think about what it was like for people who were under the... Uh, the, the Old Testament rules under, under the, the order of Aaron and the Levites. Imagine what that would have been like to be in Israel and to bring your sacrifices, to have all the blood shed, to have blood sprinkled on you. There was a lot of blood that you were witnessing. Do you really think that they thought, well, this is all just... The blood really isn't that important as everything required blood. The blood's really not that important. It's really, just, it's really just talking about death. Do you think anybody had that notion ever throughout that? No, of course not. I believe God is, is driving home a very important point throughout the entire Bible about how important that shed blood is. I mean, the Bible says that you know, when, when a man sheds blood, when someone kills someone, the only way that that's atoned for is by, is by blood being shed. He said that's the only way that, that that wrong can be right, is that you have to shed their blood now. Blood is precious. Blood is precious to all of us. The blood is the life of the flesh. And the Bible says that the blood redeems our souls. So the blood is important not just to our flesh, but Christ's blood is important for our soul. Because that's how we're saved. That's what gives our soul life, is the blood of Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this uh, great truth that you've revealed unto us, dear Lord. And it's a very important, fundamental truth. God, I pray that you would please help us not to be deceived by these wolves, not to be sucked in by something that they say that, that sounds good or something they would like, but we could diligently uh, listen to everything they say. And, you know, like that, that fox, that devil, John MacArthur, he uses a lot, of, a lot of things. He'll say a lot of things that are really close to the truth that sound right. But then he just twists it. Then he just, just perverts it and changes it, and the whole thing becomes a lie. Lord, help us to be on guard against the false prophets. Help us to be identifying them and not to read any of their materials or any of their stuff because if someone's not even saved, if someone's just, just teaching wrong, bad things, why would we go to them for anything, dear Lord? I pray that you please help us to, to have good wisdom and discernment in these matters, Lord, and, and that you would just, just teach us as we read your words, and not just the words of man, but reading your holy words, and that you would teach us through the Holy Ghost, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.